Universities play a critical role in supporting and addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. A key aspect of this role is fostering understanding of and engagement with the goals. This video will discuss Sustainable Development Goal number 13, Climate Action, with Dr Johanna Nalau and Professor Christopher Fleming. Johanna is an adaptation scientist in the City's Research Institute at Griffith University, an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow and the Science Committee Co-Chair of the World Adaptation Science Program at the United Nations. Professor Christopher Fleming is Director of Griffith Institute for Tourism and Head of Research, Future Climate Transitions, for our Climate Action Beacon. So welcome Johanna and Chris, thank you for joining us today. We're talking about Sustainable Development Goal number 13. Do you want to start by giving us a bit of an overview of what this goal is all about? Yeah, sure. So Sustainable uh, Development Goal 13 is about reducing our emissions, but also thinking about how we can adapt to the impacts of climate change. But it is also an opportunity to, to think differently, to scale innovation at global but also at local scales in how we plan and build our communities. And it's also got some things about education in there too, doesn't it? So it definitely has. Really so it is about us being able to teach a different way of thinking across all professions, you know, really put the sustainability and climate action at the core in what we do. And that means, you know, with, whether it's policy environments, education in schools, education in universities as well. And Chris, the focus on this goal is, is on action. It's not just sort of about observing or researching or those sorts of things, but actually taking action. Why is that important? Well, I think we're definitely at the point now where, where action is needed, and, and I think it's action on two fronts. Uh, both mitigation, i.e. reducing emissions and hopefully reducing the impact of climate change in the years ahead, but also realising that there's some climate change built into the system now, and so we need to prepare to, to adapt. And what's the, the first priority for you? If Sustainable Development Goal 13 was in your hands, what, what would you be saying is most important? Well, I guess as, a, as an economist by training, my, my first answer to that would be to put a price on carbon. Uh, I think that's the, the, the first, second and third best policy in terms of reducing emissions. But what I would say is one policy won't, won't solve this. We need to have a suite of policies and, and, and really aggressively pursue emissions reduction. So you said a price on carbon is... is the, the, the first, first and biggest tool, and that's not uh, not necessarily easy in a policy sense anyway. What, what are some of the other things you'd like to see in that suite of policy responses? I think the obvious ones would be to stop subsidising industries that, that are polluting unnecessarily. I, I think the message is we, we've actually got the technology there or thereabouts. Let's put some incentives in place to encourage people to do more R&D in that space, but also have consumers uptake those technologies as they become available. So some disincentives in terms of price on carbon and, and some incentives to get yeah. these new technologies. Yes, and the beauty is you can use the revenue from the price on carbon to fund the incentives, so it ends up becoming cost neutral and from a, a budget point of view. In the meantime, Johanna, we'd, we'd all like to see these uh, policy settings in place. What, what do we need to be thinking about in the way that we approach these issues? I would add to Chris's comment that we need the policy actions, but as adaptation scientists, I think we really need a shift in mindsets, in how we think, how we plan, really thinking about preparedness and innovation as well. So how can we prepare better? And that's one of the really key messages that comes when we think about adaptation, which I think makes me positive, is that we do have the capacity to harness innovation, to harness new technologies, and to learn from each other. And that's what the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change also does, is it does support both developed and developing countries to create a new mindset. Historically, countries thought that we had this under control. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more impacts of climate change, we're seeing increased temperatures, uh, extreme storms, and we know that we already have those changes locked in, and some of them are already here. So adaptation is really necessary across all societies, all communities. It's really a reality that we need to start thinking about. So we're going to have to adapt and we're going to have to take yes. action to limit climate change. Yeah. They, they go hand in hand, not yeah, in Yeah, and I think that's what Goal 13 is about. It, it is, like Chris said, it's about reducing emissions and adapting to climate change impact. You know, they go together. So there's a lot of the times people try to separate them, but you can't have them without the other. And you can have SDG 13 without the other goals either. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals are, of course, global. It, every local government and state government and the national government in Australia need to take some responsibilities. But we can also look on a global scale for examples of both good and less good practice. Chris, when you're thinking about policy uh, and you look around the world, are there countries or regions that seem to at least be heading in the right direction? 
Yeah, look, I think Europe, um, unsurprisingly, is, is further ahead than we are in Australia. And, and there's some really encouraging policies and actions happening uh, throughout Europe. And that those actions and, and policies seem to be um, increasing in, in terms of their, their strength and their popularity. But I would say I don't think any major country uh, has sufficient policies or, or sufficient outcomes in terms of reduced emissions to be meeting the kind of targets we need to meet. So we've all got more work to do. Uh, and Johanna, I know you've been looking um, perhaps a little closer to home at some of the Pacific countries and what we might learn from them about adaptation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Interestingly, a lot of the big, big countries are still trying to make commitments um, on emissions and on climate change. But Pacific Islands in particular have really taken, and small island developing states have really taken the leadership role. And they are showing in a small scale, they, they can innovate. They've, so some of the countries already have, don't use fossil fuels at all. Um, and they're really developing plans for adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So how they can prepare better for extreme storms and long-term trends like increased drought. So they are doing really innovative things across the islands already. And I think Australia and other countries have a lot to learn from them. And that, that example also shows up some of the inequities in this field, doesn't it? Because it's often the countries that are suffering the most immediately and the most severely are not the countries that are responsible for the yeah. most carbon. Uh, are there ways we should be thinking about those inequities too when we think about sustainable goal 13? One of the key things comes to, for instance, for development aid, but also climate finance. So the Paris Agreement puts quite an ambitious goal for all the developed countries to increase accessibility, but also the uh, number of climate finance available for developing countries. And that target hasn't been met yet. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do, but also how we integrate, for instance, adaptation, disaster risk reduction to the way that we deliver development aid. One of the really challenging things about climate policy is that the costs would be borne by the current rich because they're the heavy emitters. Um, and a lot of the benefits would be bestowed on the future poor uh, because obviously climate change is going to be more of a problem in the future and the poor are less able to, to respond. So trying to sell a policy either nationally or globally that costs the current rich to benefit the future poor is, is a tough sell because I think you could probably argue a lot of our policies are designed to benefit the current rich um, and they're the ones making the decisions. And I suppose it shows the way the sustainable development goals are all interrelated yes. as well because yeah. we, we can't just see uh, climate action in isolation. in isolation from inequalities in wealth, in education, in access to resources and, and all those sorts of things as well. And, and is this why we struggle in a country like Australia with things like putting a price on carbon? Why, why has that been so difficult? Well, it's been difficult because we are a resource dependent nation. We, you know, we, we do have, have generated a lot of wealth out of fossil fuel. You know, people want to look after their jobs and livelihoods and, that, and that's understandable. I also think, talking to the education piece that's part of, of Goal 13, is we haven't had a very intelligent public debate about what a carbon price would look like, what it would mean, and, and what the alternatives are in terms of future outcomes if, if we don't reduce our emissions. So I think the public debate needs to be more educated and nuanced than it's been to, to date. Every profession, every sector needs to start thinking and preparing for the impacts of climate change. So there has been a lot of investment in adaptation science in Australia, but I think the really the move needs to be how can we implement that knowledge? And especially we don't have yet a set um, national policy on adaptation, which is a requirement of the Paris Agreement. So I would say that especially in the aftermath of peace fires and now COVID, I think we really need a strong national adaptation policy. So there's a lot to be worried about in this area. Um, we talk a lot about the costs of taking action. Perhaps we don't talk as much about the costs of not taking action. Uh, I wonder if that needs to be part of the intelligent national debate you were talking about, Chris. Almost certainly. Uh, and if we look at the, the big reviews, so there was the, the, the Stern review in the UK and then the Garneau review here, which were essentially great big benefit cost analyses of, of climate action, both concluded really clearly that the cost of reducing emissions now and the benefits you receive from that in terms of avoided climate change far outweigh any costs of action. And so it pass, passes a benefit cost test really easily. Um, the costs of an action are, are, are massive, are unknown, 
there's no question, I, I don't think, among economists that action early and now makes sense from an economic point of view. Well, action now is possible. Query if action early actually still is possible. <laughs> well, the yes. economists have been saying this for yeah. a while. But help paint it for people, because I think people can see a, a clearly job losses in a coal mining town, for example. That's you know, real losses, real people, quite immediate. What are the sort of losses that economists are thinking about? Admitting some of them might be unknown, but what are some of the, the, the known unknowns? Well, I, I guess the obvious one is natural disasters. And the insurance industry is seeing that already, and in some areas are becoming very difficult to insure. Uh, wearing my tourism hat, I, I would say loss of natural assets like the Great Barrier Reef uh, a certain, would be a massive cost for the Queensland economy in, in terms of visitor spend and, and so forth. So it's, it's really that, that impact on, on nature through, and, and our built infrastructure through natural disasters. Um, you know, replacing infrastructure after a cyclone or a bushfire is, or a flood is, is incredibly expensive. And as I said, the insurance industry is already seeing them. Uh, and we're, we're filming this here in the Gold Coast uh, where the natural beauty and the, the coastline is of course a critical part underpinning a lot of jobs here. And it's one of the reasons that Griffith has been very involved in things like coastal erosion, um, partly because it's important environmentally, but it's also incredibly important economically and to, to lots of jobs around Australia, which perhaps isn't always understood. And sea level rise, I guess, is the other question where we have to start having some some uncomfortable conversations around what the coastline looks like in the future and what adaptation steps we're prepared to take. Are we defending, are we retreating, or probably a mix of the two depending on which location you're talking about. But Australia has a, an awful amount of uh, you know, high value infrastructure right on the coast at you know, relatively low levels. Um, so it's a conversation we need to start having. And what sort of conversation are adaptation scientists having about that at the moment, Joanna? What we, th we think about the fact that Australia is a very coastal country, but that's true for many places, and of course the Pacific, which you've referred to previously. So how should we be thinking about those issues of potentially rising sea levels? I know that there's been a few cases where the state government actually has said, we know that this area is highly vulnerable, flood prone. We are not going to put a new settlement there. So it is about becoming smarter. And for instance, on the Gold Coast, there are particular stretches and parks that are there for people to enjoy, but they also act as a flood buffer. And that's because the council has really looked at the planning and think about, well, the water needs somewhere to go. And back to the uh, Chris's point on, on the insurance, I think it is a very different thing if your basement floods once a year, but once it starts flooding four or five times a year, you know, the, the question on insurance and who has support and, you know, how we can help the communities to actually take some of those actions. Well, there are parts of Australia that are becoming uninsurable yes, for certain yeah. things at the moment, and that again is a real cost uh, borne by individuals mm -hmm. in those communities. So we've, uh, we've talked about some of the things that make us uh, worried and concerned, and there are plenty of those and some of the actions we'd like to take. I'd like to finish off by thinking about what might make us feel optimistic? Uh, are there good examples? Are there things that uh, that help you to still feel this is a field that's worth engaging with it? I am actually a bit more <laughs> optimistic. You know, there's so many case examples and communities who are kind of taking action and thinking about adaptation, having conversations, but also, as I said, city governments looking at how they are planning, uh, for disasters, but also thinking about you know having more water. There's lots of examples from different economic sectors where people have switched livelihoods. And I think as an educator, I see that there, there's a lot we can do to start shifting the mindsets, the way that people think about sustainability, but about climate change and what we can actually do. Okay, I've, I've got a couple of points of optimism. The, the first is around technology and the growth we're seeing in electric cars, electric planes, renewable energy. Uh, and the cost, those technologies are improving all the time at a rapid rate. The costs are coming down really, really quickly. So there's, there's definitely some room for being positive about that. The other area, I think, is to do with the, the private sector. I think the private sector are getting it in a way that perhaps our policy makers aren't. Um, I've, I've taught for over a decade now on our MBA program. And if I went back a decade and, and the conversations I was having with, my, with the MBA students, which are largely you know, executives or, or managers within organisations. Ten years ago they were asking me, should we take action? Do we need to take action? What will our customers think? What will our shareholders think? Fast forward to today, the conversation is now, we know we need to take action. What is the best way to do that? 
So the conversation has changed dramatically in the last decade and I think that's coming out of the private sector. That's great. Great cause for optimism. Local communities, private sector, people working on technology and of course at a university we do have to say also a generation of young people who I think are coming at these issues from a very different perspective to perhaps some of the generations that come before them. Thank you both very much for your time today discussing Sustainable Development Goal number 13. Thank Thanks. you.